Welcome back to Vulcan. This is the world I did the speedrun on. Um, today we are going to do uh, something more to the base. We're going to expand a little bit. Um, basically I just want to test build a system I have been making in a, in a proper survival world. So I thought we could use uh, this place where we already have uh, most of the basic setup. So uh, yeah. Um, we have to do some work and it's uh, exactly how I left it off so we don't have a lot of resources and stuff. Uh, I'll try to cut out all the boring parts and I'll leave you with all only the um, interesting stuff. So uh, the one of the first things we want to do is to make an advanced furnace. But before we do that, uh, I want to start expanding the base and then reconfigure my atmospherics a, a little bit. Okay, so I went ahead and did some rearrangement here. You can see we have expanded the frames a little bit. Uh, this is going to be the inside of the base uh, soon enough. Uh, over here, you can also see we have expanded one frame out. And it's been rearranged a little bit, and I do have a plan in my in my head on how this is going to work out. But you can see it's pretty much the same thing. The air condition is on the side. Uh, the HU combustor has been moved slightly, and uh, I have uh, already arranged for another uh, heat exchanger here, and I have added a filtration unit for CO2 feed into the base that isn't hooked up and automated yet but it's there and the the reason we are doing this is because we need the um, we need a advanced furnace of course uh, I am going to use my advanced furnace setup but we're not going to fuel it with the uh, with regular fuel and combustion we are basically just going to heat it with all the waste heat we are getting from everything else including the uh, the atmosphere the um, what was it called again uh, the air condition and we are going to use uh, water heat and pretty much everything we can find in order to not burn fuel for the furnace so yeah uh, obviously the Advanced furnace need an electron splinter tier 2 and all of these ingredients is fine but the uh, printer electronics printer mod needs constantan and constantan is one of the few alloys you haven't seen me make yet and that's because um, and that's because constantan needs uh, 1000 kelvin and we don't get 1000 kelvin on Vulcan naturally so we have to make it and we do have you know fuel mix for the generator so we could combust it that way but uh, I have another plan in order to make uh, constant time and heat up the furnace enough. You can see here is the regular furnace and I have made a box around it and I have upgraded pipes to insulate pipes. And that's because we are simply going to use the air condition heat from here to to heat the furnace so all we need to do is take this off and connect it to the furnace so now we should be able to head inside and see the temperature on the furnace rise pretty fast hopefully so I have already uh, inserted copper and nickel uh, all we need now is for the temperature to get up to 1000 Kelvin and we also need what 20 megapascal so uh, yeah it's about midday so if we just fill it 
220 megapascals with the, the hottest day, uh, daytime air. We are getting pretty far. And then we'll just wait for the air conditioner to heat the rest up. While the furnace is working, I went ahead and expanded the, the base kind of here. Uh, it's still Vulcan atmosphere in here, so we are just gonna border this up and vacuum this part. And when it's all a vacuum, we can uh, we can open the walls here and join the two bases, uh, the two parts together. So the room has now been uh, connected and obviously the autolite and pipe bender are kind of in the way but they will be moved sooner or later. Uh, I have already connected the lights and ventilation in this part of the base and the HU combustor is now in its own cube, full, uh, fully vacuumed, so that we don't lose the heat. We are still bleeding off most of the heat before we give it to the plants, but we want to capture the heat the HG combustor creates to fuel our furnace with. So, uh, I think the Constantin, yeah, it's uh, just about finished now. There we go, 100 Constantin, and I do still need to make some silicone and uh, some more uh, ingots before we can make the uh, advanced furnace. I'm going to have the advanced furnace right into the window here in the corner, so we need to move this AC and I already have a plan to place that AC over here together with probably another AC because the base will uh, as the base grows now it will start to consume more and more power and delivering the power isn't a problem this thing will deliver power all day but we need to scale the cooling out here on the atmospherics platform we have now built a new AC for the oxygen. Essentially this is going to serve the same purpose as the one we have all the way inside there. Because that's gonna have to move. So it's now sitting out here connected to the pipe on the new base segment. And I do apologize for all the, dif all the different pipes. Uh, where everyone has the same color. I, sh I assure you I will color them when we get a tool printer but uh, as of right now I don't care too much. Uh, but one difference is that you can see it's not connected to a passive vent. It's connected to a pipe and we are going to connect this one as well to the same pipe. It's just very busy right now, and I don't want to disturb it too much. But if we're quick, we, it might be all right. So if we do that, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, about now, yeah, now we're happy. So we are simply just collecting the heat from this air condition and this a AC and then we are going to run it through the water here where I have placed a heat exchanger. So we are collecting all the heat the base generates into one pipe. This uh, orange one <laughs> in the middle. And we are going to drag that pipe all the way through the base over to that corner. On the other side I have cleaned up the landing pad and satellite dish and now installed the uh, advanced furnace. So I said that I'm using my advanced furnace setup and if you have seen my video on the advanced furnace you know that the, my setup needs three things. It's need, it needs uh, something hot, something cold and a waste tank. So the pipe 
that goes right through the base here is the something hot. And let's see if we can pull that out here. The something hot is currently at uh, 3700 degrees. That's more than enough. And waste we can borrow also from the from the generator. That's uh, at some very hot waste gas. Well, not now. It's connected to a passive vent. And something cold we already have. Our coolant is very simply H2. We have uh, endless supply of it. It's uh, already hooked up to an AC, so we can cool it down. So all we need now is to pipe the H2 down to the furnace over there, as well as connect the, the waste from the generator up to the furnace as well. I went ahead and connected up the advanced uh, furnace. As I talked about, we have uh, the coolant line, which is just the H2 line that goes all the way over here and up to where it comes from. The waste line comes from the uh, generator and that's just the generator exhaust for the time being. Uh, the pipe is fairly long so I don't bother with a tank on it, it's good enough volume in this. And of course the heat line there uh, coming from the mainly the air conditioners and the water I know it's all orange but it's this line here that goes all the way through the base so with uh, the heat the waste and the coolant all set up we can uh, basically just code the, the ships I have a pipe analyzer on the waste here because the the furnace controller needs to read the, the waste statistics and since we don't have a tank from re to read from I use a pipe analyzer. I have named everything and uh, the only thing left now is to, to uh, program the ships. Now you have if you have seen my furnace video you know how that's done but this is a little bit uh, special so I'll show you what's um, what's so special about it. I only have two ICs. I have the furnace controller and the library. In the video when I, that I made on the furnace setup, I have five ICs, but those the three that's missing. It's uh, one that did the ignition pipe thing, and we don't do that here, so we don't need that. There is the oxygen controller that heats the oxygen, but since we don't do ignition, we don't need heated oxygen also because we can now just vacuum the, the furnace box. It doesn't lose heat when the, the, the container is vacuumed. So I have vacuumed that uh, container, so there is nothing in there. So I don't need the oxygen controller. And the last one, utility, we could have used, but it's not a real big issue to not have it, we just have to manage the pressure in the pipes and stuff uh, without it and most of that's fine. Uh, the H2 line is set to 10 megapascals. I'll just set an overpressure vent on the other two to the same pressure and soon enough they will all match. So for the library we have to go into here and probably scroll for a while. Furnace library. Just take that and run that to the library ship. And then we take the furnace controller. We take the advanced furnace controller dynamic. The reason it's named that is because I used to have one that wasn't dynamic. So in here, because we don't have the utility ship, we should give it the default temperature for the coolant and the, the heat and the coolant is uh, 300 Kelvin and the heat is I don't know 6000 something so there we go and we export that to the first controller 
So let's uh, start with the library and there we go and I should be able to just turn it on now. With the furnace working and all the atmospherics out of the way, we can focus on the main reason for this video, and that's the inventory system. The reason I'm calling it an inventory system is because it manages all types of item operations, like storage, smelting, crafting and distribution. It's actually several standalone systems with their own APIs that share a communication protocol. I won't go too in depth in this video. I'm planning a second video for how to set it up and a demonstration. This is more of a preview and just me playtesting the system. And the first part is to set up the storage module. Although we currently only have one vending machine, it's more than enough to get started. The storage system is now partially complete and it's a bit anticlimactic with only one vending machine but you can see that on the end here it's open-ended so this chain here we can just stack uh, several vending machines continuously over here and the system supports something like 99 vending machines and it has an input and output over there obviously those are just temporary and it works uh, in uh, works on these two ICs here, there is a storage master, only one, and then we have a storage controller, that's one per vending machine. And it has three different communication buses. So it has an internal and an external and a response on the internal. So if we give it something, let me just... Uh, put an inlet here instead of running all the way out and we give it gold ingot it should make it make its way over into the vending machine there we go so if I uh, just to give you an example of how that works I'll just use the gold uh, hash that's because it's the only thing that's currently in there. So on the internal storage bus there's a heap of different functions, but on the external one it's pretty much only two. And the first one is to just query how much uh, is currently in the system. So I just asked it to count up the quantity of gold and you see it, the message changed. Uh, it's on, can I yeah. it's basically telling me that it's 50 50 gold ingots in the system so uh, the message uh, syntax here is very simply the there is three different values uh, it's the first two digits then the next three and then whatever comes after so if I wanted it to to eject a set quantity of gold ingots, I would just put the hash for gold. I would tell it how many I want, let's say 12, and then I have to give it some kind of address. Address is relevant too much right now. And it looks like it's working. And on the output, we have now received exactly 12 gold ingots. Perfect. So that's how the storage system works. Obviously this will connect to the different systems. And the next one is the item router. And router is just a fancy word for a bunch of sorters. You can see I have put up a couple of sorters here and a few sorters here. And there is plenty more to come. But these five is the start. And you can see the back side of the autolite, the pipe bender and the electron transmitter. The router or the sorters are a system that allows any device to send any item of any quantity to any other destination. 
So not only does it allow this, this storage unit to send to either the furnace or the crafting machines, but it also allows the furnace to send ingots to either storage or the crafting machines and it even allows the crafting machines to send items to each other's. And now we just need to add the crafter logic and we can order pretty much anything with just one click. So let's say I want an ogre. I select an ogre and I select my quantity on the stacker. I only need one. And with just one press here, even though the machine is completely empty, it will now order the ingots it can from the storage. And the ingots the storage doesn't have, it will automatically create in the furnace. And the nice thing here is that it does exact quantities, so you can see it got exactly 25 electrum. There we go, the furnace automatically switched over to invar because I know I don't have any invar in the system. So the furnace logic will now order the ingredients for invar. Should be arriving, there we go, iron. and nickel and the inverse should come directly into the electron printer and it looks like it also needs to make copper there we go we have the 16 inverse in the electron printer and uh, if I remember correctly, it doesn't need 16, it, it needs 15 invar, but you can't make 15 invar in the furnace because that would require 7.5 iron and 7.5 nickel, and you can't really do that. So the logic automatically corrects and makes the uh, and corrects it up to 16. You can see now that we have everything we need, the machine automatically started working. And once it's done, it spits it out and turns itself off. And what's really nice about this is that you can run all the machines together. If we need two IC housing, go. We need 30 shoots, go. And we need five sorters, go. And they will all order ingots and um, from storage and from the furnace in parallel. So the the order the ingots will be around. It is kind of random, but it will function without any problem. It will uh, dispatch ingots and ores to all the machines all at once. I have added even more routers and even some chutes going into the middle of the room here. And on the inside you can see a small change in that the different machines here no longer outputs directly into the room. They have a chute going back into the router on the back side there. And this now allows me to order from the machines, but the items are not delivered out right here. They are instead delivered where I am. So currently, of course, I only have the shoot outlet there and the shoot outlet there and it's kind of silly with this small base, but just imagine this on a larger base. If I, uh, let's see, oh, uh, let's just make uh, two cables. If I order two cables, I think it already has the copper, yeah, it will now when, as soon as this completes, it will be either de delivered here or here, depending on where I am currently in the base. There we go. I wanted to set up a delivery zone out here as well, in case I need some stuff delivered outside. And I'll take you through the process of how to set that up. Uh, first, we just grab one of the free sorters and that this one is called uh, H, router H 
so we just pipe this uh, we just shoot this over here Just like that, we have a shoot from the, the sorter over to the atmospheric parts currently outside. So now we need to configure this outlet. And one cool thing about this system is that most of the configuration isn't done through code. It's done in runtime through the different APIs. And that also allows the different ICs to reconfigure each other. So, uh, but to set up this uh, outlet up there, I first need to assign it an address. And the address is, uh, uh, is a two digit number, but we can choose anyone I haven't used yet. We need to know uh, these two ICs here are the routers, each controlling five sorters each. And if you look at the states, this one has state two, and this one has state one. They, these are identificate, identificators, they self-assign. And I'm configuring the router named, uh, this sorter named uh, sorter RH. So I need to find that on here and it's this one so I need to configure the router uh, with the identificator 2 and I want to configure the pin on uh, D2 and I want to set an address for it and I'll use the number 42 so to configure that I need to talk to the router and uh, with the identificator 2 I want to set the address for pin number 2 and I want to set the address 42. And that message is already observed, so now the router knows that this pin, the sorter on this pin, should sort out anything um, addressed to um, the address 42. So. I could just demonstrate that by manually putting in a uh, order here. Um, I need something the storage system has. Uh, it has silicone, it seems. So uh, we go to silicone. And if I tell it to send one, uh, let's see, silicone ingot, I need just one and I want it to send I want Hydration it sent to critical. address 42 the storage system is working already and the ingot now needs to work its way through all the sorters That's our ingot delivered exactly where we wanted it. But for this machine here to deliver to wherever I am, I also need to tell it that uh, where the, the outlet is. And I do that by going on a different memory. I have uh, an IC here called the tracker. It uh, basically just tracks me with a tracker on the roof and keeps the system updated on which uh, outlet that I'm closest to. So to configure that outlet there, I need to go on the tracker config and I need to tell to configure address 42. Then I need to step outside. And once outside, I just need to uh, figure out the, the boundary box for this. So I just place myself in one corner. So down here. 
and I turn my air off. Now the system will all automatically turn it back on for me, but that's how I tell the system that I'm now at one corner of the boundary box. And then I head over to the other boundary box and will give this boundary box some height. So I'll just fly up here and we toggle the air again. And that's it. System now knows that as long as I'm here, anything that's uh, directed to me should be dropped out here. And we can also make an order panel like this. This is just an alternative way to tell the system what to make or deliver. And uh, right now I just set it up so it's very blank, but if I put something in the shoot, you see it pops up on the display. And I can order singles or stacks. And uh, if I take it out, it disappears. But if I wanted to save it to the system, it will now stay there. And I can now just send it off and it should end up in the storage system. And what's nice about this order panel is that if I order it here, if I order, for example, one stack, it will first dispatch all the cables it has in the storage. And that is not the full quantity we ordered. So the rest of the missing items will be told to be made. And uh, it looks like uh, this guy is already on the job to make the rest of the cables. So the regular stuff you always need more of, like uh, cables and uh, glass, can just be added to the list. And we can send it off to the storage system. And there is no longer any need to have shelves for them, because we can store it all in the vending machine and just order it up back up when we need it. With a tiny bit of code in an IC in the suit, I can even order directly from my backpack. Here I have a wall in the first slot. And if I want to tell the system that I need a stack of walls, I simply toggle my stabilizer and the autolight kicks in gear to make more walls. And the nice thing about both the, both the ordering from the suit and from this panel here is that this uh, includes a queue. So I can pretty much just spam whatever I need. Uh, let's see, we need, uh, sure, a stack of pipes. We need uh, several stacks of shoots. Let's do three. And uh, let's see. Let's do more cable. Always need more cable. Sheets popping down in my face. And you can see the pipe ender has started working as well. All of this stuff here is stuff that the storage system already had. And now the electronic printer as well started working on some cable. And all the orders that hasn't been assigned yet will just sit in a queue. And uh, whenever the machines uh, open up and finish working and they there is something in the queue they can make, they will just start working on the next thing. But we are not done yet. I have expanded the storage so that we now have two regular vending machines and 
one refrigerated vending machine and I have also expanded the base with another wing and you can probably guess from what's already placed here that we are expanding the system to also include automating food production but the real reason I'm bringing you back right here is because I am um, running out of power well I'm not running out of power per se but I'm running out of capacity on this wire Now, currently it's only at 3 kilowatts, but when all the ACs kick into gear and when we have machines running and everything, it reaches the capacity of this 5 kilowatt wire. And right now, all the wires, all the five regular wires here, throughout the entire base is the same network. And uh, for me, this is not a surprise, I have seen this coming. But I just want to give you a small hint, and that's um, you always want to, when you are expanding the base, to have a critical point where you can uh, cut the wire. Now obviously I could cut the wire anywhere, but you want one place where you can cut the wire and perfectly split the base into two separate parts without making any troubles for all the logic. And for me that place is right here. And you can see pretty much half of the base just went dark. But I have a point over here where I have a heavy cable to a small cable here. And you can probably guess that this is without power now. So if I just add a, come on, a transformer right here and set this to 4900 the base is up and running again and none of the ICs complain about anything I went ahead and finished up the Harvey corner so we now have four Harveys here and four Harveys should be more than enough to feed me uh, I have also connected up the automated oven and the packing machine as well as an additional order panel right here. And I wanted to bring you guys along for something extraordinary. You see, on, the, on this mountain of automation, we find peak inefficiency. And that is what hap what's happening when I press this button. You see, the IC that's controlling this panel will, when I press the button, put out a request for one canned tomato soup. Now that may sound kind of sim simple but the store system doesn't really have anything. It has raw ores and seeds pretty much. So let's try to follow it along and uh, see what happens. So the first thing that happened is that it placed the order. The packing machines picked up, picks up the order and of course the packing machine is empty so it orders cooked tomatoes and it will order an empty can and the autolite will again order steel I think I saw the tomato seeds being dispatched there and the furnace switch to steel and the steel should be coming up fairly soon there is tons of sorters behind here working their magic and the tomato seeds should end up here. Now of course, waiting for tomatoes to grow each time you, you need a can uh, a can of soup is why I'm calling it peak inefficiency. It's really cool, but mm, this this isn't super useful. And I do have a solution for it, but... Ah, there we go, harvest. But before I implemented the solution, I wanted to show you guys uh, how this works. So, uh, the steel should be gone. Oh, there we go. The steel is sent off. And we have steel in the outlets. 
and the can should end up here very soon. So, so far I have been living like this. Hydration critical. Every time I needed something, the system would order exact amounts. There we go, empty can in the packer. Now ordering in, in exact amount isn't the problem, but when you only have raw ores in the store system, it's kinda slow. Because every time I order something from the electronics printer for example, it will have to furnace up the gold and the iron and the copper each and every time this one needs one or two. So. Uh, the solution for that is this, called the auto stocker, and it will um, simply monitor the storage system and I can configure it to keep a set amount of different items always in stock, so that we can have, for example, ingots and, uh, ingots and um, plants always in stock so that the machines doesn't have to furnace up every gold and wait for the tomatoes to grow each time. And the auto stocker comes with a nifty screen that also informs us uh, what the quantity of each item is and this guy just loops through the different items and if they are below the required level, it will just order up more. So you can see we have 146 Electrum in the storage system right now. And that's well below, well above my, uh, my limit on it. So uh, it still doesn't uh, refill tomatoes, it doesn't keep tomatoes in the system. So I wanted to do that uh, with you. So the auto stocker, like the other ICs, has a runtime configuration. So we need the tomato prefab hash. And we just paste that in here. And then we have to tell it what the minimum uh, level should be. And I think 10 is enough. That's 10 tomatoes in the system. And if it is lower than 10, we can order two should be enough. So there we go. And uh, the memory is already empty. The IC has taken the message. So whenever this loops through and reaches tomato, it will ask the store system how many tomatoes do you have? And if that number is less than 10, it will simply place an order for tomatoes, which will be uh, answered like normal orders by the uh, Harvey system. But there is still something we're missing and that's going to go right here. But for that we had to set up the landing pad again. So we have a new trader setup over here, mostly because just uh, there was room here. So. And um, yeah, we of course need some chickens. No base is complete before you can make pumpkin pie. With uh, Carla the chicken now in her chicken pen and uh, Harvey's working hard on stocking the storage system um, we are pretty much done with this base and this video. Uh, I thought we could order the first pumpkin pie together. So, yeah, the machine is empty, pumpkin pie selected. Go! So hopefully we'll get a pumpkin pie pretty soon. Um, if you haven't seen this chicken pen design, it's uh, Kinda simple. It's the same design I used on my uh, Venus uh, world. And it's basically just a motion sensor in the roof there and the chicken controller I see here reading that uh, motion sensor. And whenever Carla spits out an egg, uh, if it doesn't jump straight into the chutes, then the I see will just turn the, uh, the activant on and 
flicker it between in and out so that uh, we get some motion in the air and soon enough the egg will roll into the chutes. And once every five minutes she gets um, uh, she gets a wheat delivered of course automatically from the system. So yeah, uh, I have printed up the base a bit. Uh, I've added some flowers around here. These flowers are just for decoration. Uh, we added the seating area. Um, oh, there's a pumpkin pie. So I guess we'll eat up. And the nice thing now is that we can add it here, and I can just send it off to the, to the storage. So yeah, I have cleaned up. Um, I removed all the shelves here. Pretty much everything is either recycled or in the storage system. I have some shelves up here just for a regular odd stuff. Uh, if you're wondering about the time scale, uh, how much time it has taken me, uh, the first three hours I did the speedrun on, I almost emptied out uh, one can of tomato soup. And now this is the only thing I have left from the lander. So it's uh, it's been uh, many hours. But yeah, over here I have uh, added uh, just some railings for decoration. I thought about covering up the floor and you know covering up everything and making it more and uh, making it nicer here. But I figured somebody is going to download the world soon enough and rip everything off anyway. So. <laughs> Why bother? Um, I have a display here showing me the power consumption and uh, yeah the recycler it's just a trash can here for everything I don't want. Yeah um, that's the inside part. Yeah I also co colored all the pipes and the cables so the pipes are now clearly marked with correct color and the different cable networks have different colors just as I promised. You know those traders, right? They they can smell what you need, and then they will refuse to bring it to. So I spent a lot of time just waiting for a trader that will give me eggs. I thought we could head out, and you can uh, get a look at the base now from the outside. I think we need some juice in the jetpack, so let's. Uh just uh, pop that in here, should be enough. Nice sunrise here on Vulcan. So yeah, um, the atmospheric is pretty much the same. Um, you can see I've added three ACs here now for cooling the, the oxygen or the room there though. Um, the third one I have never seen on, but the first one is always on. And it, this isn't even connected to any logic now, it's just always on. Uh, I have... Uh, I don't remember when I added this, but this just squirts a uh, uh, small amount of CO2 into the base whenever it's all empty. Well, whenever there is no more CO2 in the base. And this just cleans the base out of... Uh, cleans the base for pollutant and um, all tiles, primarily so that I can run around and paint stuff inside. And yeah, that's all the changes here. Uh, nice and colored. Um, yeah, um, if we fly up here, you can s get a better look on of the base from above. And um, yeah, there's uh, a lot of shoots, hundreds and hundreds of uh, shoots. And uh, I think we're up to something like 20 sorters all around. These are for the harvest and then yeah the different machines and panels and whatever. So it, the base has grown a lot since we started and yeah if you wondered where the ogre went it's down here and it's been digging a bit but honestly not worth it on Vulcan. Yeah, the ogre just stops whenever it reaches one of these uh, gaps in the terrain and then I have to come and pave it a path and restart it. 
just not worth the time. If you are curious about this system and want more details on it, uh, on how it works and how everything is set up, then I promise you I will make a different video on that, where I go a lot more in depth and show you a lot more details. There is a lot more to it than what I can set, show you here. So um, yeah, the main reason for this playthrough was to test to see how useful it is in survival and to find any bugs and there is a few kinks here and there that I need to iron out. I have made some notes in my notebook so I will get to that and when that's all done I will release the code along with a really thorough uh, how-to guide. But I think that's it for this video. Um, I'm not sure if I will release the world download yet. I might wait for the codes to be completely finished. But uh, anyway, um, thank you guys for watching.